On behalf of the director, Susan Weber, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here to the Bard Graduate Center for, how about now? So um, I'll start again. On behalf of the director, Susan Weber, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here tonight to the Bard Graduate Center. Those of you here in the lecture hall on West 86th Street, and those of you watching around the world on BGC TV. I'd also like to take this moment to acknowledge that the intellectual and social life of the Bard Graduate Center here on West 86th Street on the island of Manahata unfolds on the ancient, uh, ancestral, and current land of the Lenape uh, peoples. This is the um, fourth in the annual Leon Levy Foundation Lectures in Jewish Material and Culture. And so it's my pleasure at this point uh, to express my deep gratitude to Shelby White and to the Leon Levy Foundation for their support for this project, and also to the David Berg Foundation for their support for this project. For those of you interested in catching up rapidly, you can go to our YouTube channel and watch the three previous lecture series. That's uh, 12, nine lectures, so it'll take you uh, at least uh, nine hours. But for those of you who don't want to do that, I'll summarize in the following way. The first uh, lecture series given by Andrea Berlin and the third series given by uh, Zev Weiss were devoted to um, separately, but in fact creating a new um, cosmopolitan Near Eastern Jewish uh, archaeological history, the material culture of the Jews from Hellenistic times through late antiquity, uh, looking closely and reflecting the evidence of material culture. The second lecture series was devoted to Jewish families in early New York from the 17th through the middle of the 19th century, and Laura Liebman's series uh, will actually be the first of the published versions of these lectures. Her book, Art of the Jewish Family, um, uh, early, uh, Jews in Early New York uh, in uh, five objects will be published this March uh, by the Bard Graduate Center. And those of you who want to put it on your calendar, the launch event uh, is March 23rd, when the author will be in conversation with Jonathan Sarna um, uh, and Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet. Uh, this whole series is, in some sense, as I've said uh, in the introduction to the three previous ones, this whole series is, in some sense, a, f a fulfillment of. Uh, a proposal made in 1926 um, by Ludwig Blau, a great uh, Hungarian scholar, who uh, wished for the creation of a Jewish archaeology, the history of the Jews through material remains. He called it, and it's not insignificant, early Christian archaeology from a Jewish point of view, because what he wanted to gesture at was Archaeologia Sacra, the recovery of early Christianity in Rome by antiquarians at the end of the 16th century, the really the beginning of the material culture of Christianity. And that was the model that he proposed for uh, Jewish history. Uh, and last year in uh, Zev Weiss's series, we saw that at the same time that Blau was writing those words, Eliezer Sukenik uh, in Mandatory Palestine was in fact carrying out the project of a Jewish archaeology, as he in fact described it. With this year's series, we turn to the Middle Ages, uh, as seen through the finds of the Cairo Geniza, one of the great adventures of 20th century historical scholarship, and now a hotbed of research on life from the bottom up in the 21st century, perhaps even eventually from some point in a more distant future to be seen as the annal uh, of the 21st century. Um, it also gives us a chance to explore a question that we have not explored yet uh, in this series, uh, and that is the question of what is Jewish in Jewish material culture. Uh, in lecture series one and three, those of Berlin and Weiss, we specifically addressed this when we tried to talk about, archaeologically speaking, what was a Jewish object. Uh, when we ask Zev Weiss to tell us what at Sepphoris made for a Jewish house that had a pagan mosaic, as opposed to a pagan house that had a pagan mosaic, 
we confronted this question directly. And today we're going to start addressing this question again, but from uh, a different, perhaps wholly 180 degree opposite perspective. We're not going to seek out the Jewish object, but rather we're going to use a source that comes to us from an explicitly Jewish context, let's say fine spot, in this case, the storeroom in the attic of the Ben Ezra synagogue in Fustat, to understand what was common or koine in the Mediterranean region circa 1000, the Islamic Mediterranean, but which might otherwise lack textual verification or identification. So where Jewish material culture was in fact no different than general material culture, our ability in Egypt to specify the Jewish use and possession of things may serve as a guide to understanding the world Jews inhabited, books, adornment, food, the subjects of these three lectures that will follow. So this is another aim of our project, Jewish material culture not only telling us about the world the Jews lived in, but as a mirror reflecting much more precisely uh, and with uh, greater light on the world the Jews themselves lived in. Over these next three Wednesdays, our guide to this world will be Miriam Frankel, Associate Professor in the Department of Jewish History in the School for History of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Her BA is in Middle Eastern Studies and Islamic Culture from the Hebrew University. Her MA was in Islamic Studies, also from the Hebrew University, where her thesis topic was the Jewish community of Aleppo in the Middle Ages, based on materials from the Cairo Geniza. And her doctoral dissertation, also at the Hebrew University, on the Jewish community of Alexandria in Fatimid and Ayyubid times, portrait of a leading elite. She's the author of six books, uh, collections of documents, hard earned um, effort to uh, recover these materials and make them available to scholars. I'll just give you some of the titles. First, the Jews of Sicily, 825 to 1068, documents and sources. The Jews of Egypt, 1007 to 1055. The Book of Adolescence by Rav Shmuel ben Chofni and the Book of Years by Rav Yehuda HaKohen, 1999. The Compassionate and Benevolent, the Leading Elite in the Jewish Community of Alexandria in the Middle Ages, published in 2006. Pilgrimage, Jews, Christians, Muslims, published in 2014. Texts as Objects, Objects as Texts, these were the Einstein Lectures in Islamic Studies, published in 2013. She's also uh, edited uh, seven collected volumes, just to give you the titles. Jewish Medieval Library, Book Lists from the Cairo Geniza. Cultural Encounters Between Jews and Muslims in the Middle Ages. Charity and Giving in Monotheistic Religions. Aleppo Studies, Aleppo Studies II. Israel in Egypt, Egypt and Israel, the land of Egypt as concept and reality for Jews in antiquity and the medieval period, and the Jews of Egypt in the Middle Ages. She's also, uh, as a scholar, chaired the research group on charity and piety in Judaism, Islam and Christianity in late antiquity and the Middle Ages at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Jerusalem, uh, and has held research grants from the Israel Science Foundation for research on the formation of a Muslim society in Palestine, and most recently, the world of the book in medieval Jewish society uh, under Islam. At the Oxford Center for Hebrew and Jewish Studies in 2016, she led a research group on the land of Egypt as concept and reality for Jews in antiquity and the medieval period. Uh, and not to cite the titles of all of her many articles and books, but just one for tonight, uh, published in 2015, um, Evidence of Material Culture from the Geniza, an Attempt to Correlate Textual and Archaeological Findings. That's published in a volume entitled Material Evidence and Narrative Sources, Interdisciplinary Studies of the History of the Muslim Middle East. And so with all of this, we are, I think, uh, in safe hands and sure hands to guide us through the medieval Mediterranean uh, in the fragments from the Cairo Geniza. Miriam Frankel, please.
Thank you so much, Peter, for this kind introduction. And thank you also for inviting me to take part in this unique and very special center. I'm very happy about it. Um, and thank you all for coming this evening. I was in the Elijah Synagogue and searched in a Geniza. I gave five. This brief enigmatic note was written by Simon von Gildern in his diary on the occasion of his visit to the Cairo, to Cairo in 1752. The Elijah Synagogue mentioned here is probably the synagogue better known as the Ben Ezra Synagogue. The exact place where over a century later will be in which the, 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 the famous Cairo of Niza will be discovered, taken out, and scattered all over the world. The Cairo Gniza, since this is a very heterogeneous public, I'll spend a few minutes to explain what the Geniza, the, the Cairo Geniza is. Well, it's a collection of some 300,000 Jewish manuscript fragments that were found in a storeroom in this synagogue in Fustat, near Egypt. Nowadays, Fustat is part of Egypt, but in the, in the Middle Ages, it was a distinct town, a town of its own, very, very close to, to Cairo itself. Now, you can see here, this is a model of the, of the synagogue itself. It didn't look this way in the Middle Ages. It was surrounded with many other buildings, residences, um, institutions of the Jewish community that were, were all around. But the building itself is still there, it's still in Cairo, you can visit it. It was even reconstructed later, uh, lately. Um, you can see that somewhere here, there is an, a, an extension of the building and you can have a look at the roof. This is the interior of the synagogue itself. Now, from here, from the gallery here, yeah, you can see the red arrow. From here, used manuscripts, used writings that had no more, that were no, no more usable, no more in use, were uh, stored in an annex, in, a, in an extension of, uh, of the building. And here is the window from which it was, from which it, from which it was thrown and, uh, and reserved in this, in this uh, side room. Um, it, why, were, why were these documents stored over there? They were stored over there because of uh, due to a, the Jewish custom of storing or burying worn out Hebrew language books and papers that may have the name of God written on, on them. Since it is deemed forbidden to throw away writings containing the name of God. Now, all these manuscripts gathered there for almost a thousand years, when taken together, they comprised the largest and most diverse collection of medieval ma manuscripts in the world. And they are a major source of information about the Islamic Age civilization in its golden age, mainly between the 10th and the 13th century, which was more or less the golden age of Islam. Simon von Gelden, if we go back to him, was a great uncle of Heinrich Heine. And he was probably the first foreigner in modern times to enter the Geniza room. He was a passionate traveler to the East, and according to his celebrated nephew, was attracted, what attracted him were his mystical and Kabbalistic inclinations. He even claimed to have a mystical vision once when visiting the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. So we may assume that it was Jewish Kabbalistic knowledge that Simon von Gildern was looking for in the Geniza chamber. About a hundred years later, Yaakov Sapir, Rabbi Yaakov Sapir, a delegate, Shadar, of the Jewish community in Jerusalem, a very erudite scholar and a great connoisseur of Jewish manuscript, made several attempts at entering the Geniza chamber. In his diary, he told, he, he wrote, they told me that it is a very ancient, a chamber filled with discarded books from days of old. After some failures, 
Yaakov Sapir succeeded to receive the permission of the local synagogue attendants and entered the Geniza room. And he writes, after I had toiled for two days and was covered with dust and grime, I picked out some pages of various old books, though I found, of, I found them of, I found nothing of value in them. Now, probably Yaakov Sapir, who was, as I said, a great connoisseur, a great expert of Jewish manuscript, he was probably looking for some very, very old knowledge about Jewish, Jewish culture, about, about the Judaic, a Judaic knowledge. And since he visited the place when, uh, from, from, the, from the roof, he probably cl climbed the roof and entered from the roof above, what he could find was very, very new manuscript, and not even manuscript, they were probably prints, which were of no interest of him. So he returned to his place in Jerusalem quite, quite disappointed. At about the same time, Avraham Firkovich, a Karaite Jew from Russia, of Russian origin, also visited the place. Uh, and he did succeed to, to, to receive and to put his hand off quite a lot of manuscript, medieval manuscript. Um, Avraham Firkovich was not only a very very learned person. He was also a political leader. He was a political leader of the Jews, of the Karai Jews in Russia. And he strived to get for them, to receive for them civil rights. He was convinced that if he could convince the Russian authorities that the Karai Jews were in Crimea or in Russia itself, for many, many years, even before the, the Christian era, before Jesus Christ was crucified, this will be the ultimate, the ultimate proof that they can receive, that they, they can receive, they are entitled for, for civil rights. Further, the two sisters, Agnes Lewis and Margaret Gibson, both of them, you can see that they, they, they are, it's very, very obvious that they are twin sisters, both of them, both of them of uh, Scottish origin, very, very uh, self-taught, very, very erudite, very, very learned, and also devout Presbyter Presbyterians, uh, uh, Christian pr Presbyterians. They lived in, uh, in uh, at this time, they lived in Cambridge, uh, and were some were active in the margins of the academia, not in the academia itself, but uh, but in the margins. And they encountered something that I always wished for myself, and probably never happened to me anymore. At a young age, very young age, they inherited a fortune. <laughs> so. Being devout Christians and very interested in the sources, in the origins of Christianity, they decided to dedicate their lives and their money in order to, to put their hands on ancient manuscripts that were related to the origins of Christianity. This is, this is what interested them. And indeed, they embarked upon a very ambitious a journey, a, a travel all over the world. Uh, there are pictures of them in the uh, in crinolines and so on upon camels in various parts of the world. At some point in their lives, they received two manuscripts. Uh, now they were very learned; they knew perfect uh, biblical Hebrew, but they couldn't understand. They absolutely couldn't understand these two manuscripts. So they went to their good friend Solomon Schachter and asked him about, about what, are, what are these two, these two manuscripts. Schachter uh, identified one of the manuscripts as, the, uh, as a, a page from Ecclesiasticus. Ecclesiasticus is, a, is an apocryphal book written in the second century BC, and uh, it was part of the Christian canon, though not all Christian denomination received it. Anyhow, it was a, a, a subject of debate inside, a theological debate inside Christianity. So this is probably the reason that the Gibson-Lewis sisters were interested to go there 
and find the origin of the to go to, to Cairo or to send Solomon Schechter to Cairo and find the origin of this specific uh, manuscript. It was the origins of Christianity that interested them. If we go back to Solomon Schechter himself, Solomon Schechter was also in the margins of the academia, of the Cambridge Academia, um, because he was probably not because he was a woman, as the, as the, as the sisters, as the uh, Louis Gibson sisters, but probably because he was Jewish. Anyhow, he was a tutor of Hebrew and Talmud at this time, a great scholar and a great expert in Jewish manuscripts. Um, at, the, at the request of the, of, the, of the sisters, he had a look at these two manuscripts. Now, there's a very telling paragraph in the diary of, uh, of Agnes Lewis. She writes, Schechter was already huddled over the large dining room table, intently examining the fragments. Without much ado, he identified one vellum leaf as a rare and valuable page from the Palestinian Talmud, a great discovery for this time. Then he held up a diary scrap of paper. Mm, this too is very interesting. May I take it away and identify it? Certainly, said Agnes. I noticed, writes the, the other right, Margaret, I noticed his eyes were glittering, although the script looked as if a grocer had used it for something greasy. This is a script, if you are curious. Schechter, it seems, realized its importance almost, almost instantly, and within an hour of his racing from our home at Kesselbrei, with the two items, we have received a telegram I hope the young generation still knows what it is. From the, Cherry, from the Cherry Hinton Road post office, just around the corner from the Schechter's house on Rock Road. Fragment, very important. Come to me this afternoon. This was the telegram. What drew Schechter into the spell of this fragment that May afternoon in the Giblus, that the nickname of the not a very favorable nickname of the Gibson Lewis sisters, in the Giblos dining, dining room. What notions were kindling, kindling the glitter in his eyes that Margaret had seen when Schechter asked if he might take the leaf of, Sol, of, sorry, of the Ben Sira for inspection? What it was about the 17 badly mutilate, mutilated lines of verse from the second century BC that roused the Romanian scholar and caused him to orchestrate his expedition to Egypt. These questions were asked by Adina Hoffman and Peter Cole in a fa their fascinating book, Sacred Trash, that tells the whole story of the discovery of the Geniza. And the answer they provide in the book is very convincing too. Schechter, they claim, felt very uneasy about the line of inquiry adopted at his time by some Cambridge biblical scholars who perceived much of the Jewish history as continual deterioration from the heights of early prophetic vision to a preoccupation with stiff ceremony and dry legal sophistry. Perhaps I have also to, to add that the Ecclesiasticus, the, the wisdom of Ben Sira at this time was known in many, many uh, translations. It was translated and known in uh, Latin, in Greek, in um, Georgian, in Russian, in Gez, in almost every existing language, but not in Hebrew. So these scholars at Cambridge, most of them Christian Protestant Protestants, argued that there was no Hebrew original, that it was not written Hebrew in Hebrew in the in the origin, um, because Judaism at that at that time during the, at the time of the Second Temple in the second century uh, BC was al already stagnant. It couldn't possibly produce such an elaborated, such, a, such elaborated uh, uh, literature. It was just a 
a, a religion of a stagnant religion of priestly ritual and dry dry legalism. Now, as I said. Schechter was very, very uneasy and un- unhappy with this. And he, it was his ambition to show that this was not true, that his religion was still la- alive and uh, continuous. And certainly during the, the second, uh, the, uh, during this, uh, the era of the Second Temple, it was still lively and produced a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, of literature. Now, he believed that with this one leaf, yeah, he can do it. And the way to receive, to put his hand on this leaf, on this one paper, one uh, page, went through the Cairo Geniza. Uh, let's go back to all our Geniza veterans. Yaakov Sapir was looking for some ancient Jewish knowledge. Avraham Firkovich was looking for the origins of the Karaite Jews. The, the sisters Gibson and Lewis were, were looking for the origins of Christianity. Schechter was trying to, to show that the rabbinic Judaism was still very much alive in the second, in the second century BC. So the whole arena of uh, Geniza studies at this time, at these early times, looked more or less like a playing ground of Judaism and Christianity, or rather like a wrestling arena. Nobody really found, uh, found any testimony or any evidence for the eternal truth, neither of Judaism and nor of Christianity. But what was found, after all, and today, after over a century of Geniza research, we can say for sure, what was discovered was a new culture, a new society about which we knew very little. And this culture and society was an indispensable part of the Islamic age civilization. Uh, So through it, we can tell a lot about, not only about Jewish culture, and not only about Jewish um, society at this time, but also about the great, great Islamic hate civilization in its golden, in its golden age. Another thing that uh, the veterans of Geniza, of Geniza studies at this very early stage could not realize was that they were witnessing, as a matter of fact, a very great re- revolution. Instinctively, they were looking for books. Now, being 19th century scholars, they took books for granted. They didn't understand that books were something new and a kind of very, very new revolution. Um, Yaakov Sapir expected, I quote, a chamber filled with discarded books from days of old. Um, uh, Schechter described the Geniza chamber as a battlefield of books. And then when he came back to Cambridge, he started to sort the many manuscripts in big grocery boxes, as attested by his wife, Mathilde, uh, according to the classical way that libraries were sorted in Europe. Um, Literature, Bible, theology, philosophy. So he was really expecting he also was expecting to find books or find of, or, or parts of books. But they could not, neither Schechter nor the other scholars could not really realize that they were witnessing one of the most significant revolutions that took place in the medieval world of Islam, the revolution of the book. The 300 years between the 10th and the 12th century, usually termed as the classical Geniza period, were actually the era of the book itself. itself. Books spread in the world of Islam among Muslim, Christians, and Jews alike, bringing about a profound revolution. The first phases of this, this revolution started already in the 9th century. The prominent writer, Al-Jahis, in the 9th century, could expand page upon page, praising the excellence of some books. In the 10th century, the great bibliographer, Ibn Ibn al-Nadim, in (coughs) Baghdad, could cite hundreds, if not thousands, of items of books. Um, 
the, the, the big impact of the revolution can perhaps best be exemplified by the anecdote about al the same the same Al-Jahis, 10th century al who was the ultimate bibliophile. And the anecdote says that he used to sleep in a bookshop in the cellar of a bookshop in order to be able to read as many books as he liked and with nobody interfering. And he found his sudden sweet death when a pile of huge books collapsed upon, upon, her, upon him. So I, what we, well, I doubt it if it's, it's a real story, but anyhow, it tells a lot. It tells something about the fear of people for, from this new revolution. And it's typical of revolution to arouse fear, a fear from the revenge of the new thing, the new, the new phenomenon, the new thing that was called books and, was, and aroused not only enthusiasm, but also a, a lot of fear. Um, although it probably started already in the 9th century, it was actually from the 11th century onwards that the diff- diffusion of the written word in the form of books has caused a distinctive, distinctive transformation of cultural practices in the Islamic world. The role of the written word increased significantly and the society went through a process of textualization, which made it the world's most bookish society at the time. From the point of view of the volume of production and dissemination of books, as well as of their quality and variegation, it can be safely co- compared to the revolution of the print that happened some centuries later. Um, this incredible process is very well testified in the so many books that we have from the uh, from uh, from medieval uh, Islam uh, of all kinds. Uh, travel logs, science books, theology books, books in theology, books in medicine, and so on. But perhaps it, it is uh, exemplified and it is testified even better through the so many books and parts of books that were found in the in the Jewish in the Cairo in the Cairo Geniza. Now this revolution involved a very significant morphological change. The traditional form, the traditional form of a parchment scroll, gradually was gradually abandoned and replaced by a codex. The traditional form was a parchment, either in a in a form of a, a horizontal scroll or in the form of a vertical uh, rotulus, as we called it, um, and. These, these kind of, of uh, books uh, uh, s- gradually disappeared and gave, gave, uh, gave place to a new kind of book, which we call the Codex. What is a Codex? A Codex involved, involves a number of sheets, either of papyrus or, of arch- or parchment, later on of paper, they are folded together to, to, uh, into choir, choirs. They are stitched in the, in, the, in the center to form a kind of series of opening pages. You know, just a form of a regular book, the kinds that we used to read before, uh, before the Kindle. Uh, the, at, at this time, this was a really, a really, a great, a great, a great uh, innovation. Um, it was much easier. It was much easier to be carried. It's much easier to carry a book. Yeah. It can have all kinds of formats, all kinds of sizes. In the Geniza, we found very, very small prayer books, amulet books that probably pilgrimage, pilgrimage pilgrims took with them uh, on, their, on their travels. Uh, we can also find in the Geniza a kind of long books that could be inserted inside, inside a discrete pocket of the sleeve. I'll talk about it next time when we talk, when we, when we, we'll talk about, when I'll talk about clothes, uh, clothing. Um, it was easier to carry, it was easier to be stored it's much easier to store a book, I mean a codex, than a scroll. Um, 
of course, it's much easier to read. Instead of each time to ro uh, rolling and unrolling a huge, long and heavy, heavy scroll, you can just browse among the papers, especially if you are looking for a special reference. You know, the, the, the possibilities, the option of browsing yeah, does not exist in the, in, the, in the scroll. You can write on both sides of the paper which can really uh, uh, save you a lot of uh, material, mat write, writing material. Um, so it really proved to be, and uh, yeah, and of course it is much better protected, especially if it is, by, it is, uh, it is bounded, if you attach it to a hardboard by binding. Uh, the new practical form of book was not invented by the Muslims, as a matter of fact. It was first adopted and promoted by the Christians for, copy, for, co for copying the Bible, either out of ideological motivation as a way to manifest their self-identity, as argued by Resnick and others, or out of practical reasons in order to get the new convenient in a, into a cheap and convenient form for constant use, as argued by McCohen and uh, other scholars. Uh, there's another way of explaining the invention of the Codex. An Italian scholar by the name of Serena Amirati maintains that actually the first ones to invent or to use the Codex were not the Christians, not the first Christians, but the Byzantine jurists, who used it to, for recording the legal text, which were assembled together over time. The Codex proved to be the ideal format for a corpus of founding text, which accum accumulated over time and shaped into a, f a normative system. Uh, such were the Byzantine imperial constitutions which began to be formalized from the third century until Justinian's initiatives, the Corpus Juris Civilis. In any case, in the fourth century, the Codex and the Roll were employ em employed equally. And by the sixth century, a century before the advent of Islam, the Roll was totally rejected for literary text and since then has been used only for documentary and liturgical purposes. But the Jews did not take any part in this process, in this early process. The very scanty findings of Jewish, any of some Jewish literature from this period of time, are all, all of them are written upon scrolls. So Jews went on to read the, the literature or whatever they had, mainly, mainly liturgical literature upon, upon scrolls. Uh, they, were ever, they even became associated with this kind of writing. And when in the ninth century, Al-Kindi, a famous, a famous Muslim writer, tries to show that the first Quran, Quran books were written upon leaves or scrolls, so he finds it necessary to explain and say, you know, rolls, the kind of the, the, of the same kind that Jews write their literature upon it, it's the same the same kind that is used by the Jews. Um, the earliest evidence for Jews using the Codex format date from after the Muslim conquest, and. Um, Actually, um, the very term for a codex in, uh, used by the Jews is mishaf, which is a loan word, Arabic loan word. Yeah, in Arabic it's mashaf, and uh, in Hebrew, in Hebrew writings, it's uh, it's mishaf. So we can assume safely that the Jews adopted the the this kind of writing upon a codex using the codex they they learned it from the from the muslim from the muslims now for um, for the jewish society for the jewish culture this was even a greater revolution since since the second temple uh, time since the second temple uh, era with the rich literature of the apocryphal books Maccabim and so on, and the rich literature found in the, in the Judean desert scrolls. And until the end of the 9th century, the beginning of the 10th century, we hardly, have, we hardly have, have any written literature, Jewish 
li Jewish uh, written literature, what whatsoever. Now, how should we explain it? How should we explain really the huge gap that we don't have anything written down by Jews? It could be that there were some writings, some, some Jewish writings that were not preserved, were disappe disappeared either by either by conquerors or by prosecutors and so on. I think that a better explanation is just that Jews did not write down their traditions. They preferred to transmit it orally. And most of the Jews, most of the Talmud and the Mishnah and all the writings were actually transmitted orally and not by writing. It's, I know that it sounds quite amazing these days, but this was the way probably, and we have quite a lot of evidence that this was the way that Jewish tradition was transmitted during all this very long, very long period. Anyhow, from the 10th century onward, we have an explosion of Jewish writings, most of them found in the Geniza. Some of them also uh, have already been um, uh, reconstructed. And um, uh, and uh, we have them nowadays in um, uh, the holy the holy version uh, of these books. Um, so the, the 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 appearance of the book that went together with the appearance discovery of the of the codex, uh, as I said before, had very very deep social implications uh, as well. As I try to show, uh, okay, here we have uh, some other some other pictures of of a codex and how yeah and how it is um, manufactured. Anyhow, in my book about the Jewish Ale Jewish community of Alexandria, my Hebrew book about the Jewish community of Alexandria, um, an English translation coming soon, by the way. Uh, I try to show how. The elite, the Jewish elite at this time, functioned as a cosmopolitan global elite that was based both on trade and on education and and literature. It was uh, it was a commercial and an intellectual elite at at one at the same time, and it was precisely this form, this circle, this social circle that adopted the new culture of the book and made it its own epithet. Um, perhaps it can be best shown or exemplifi exemplified through, through one, one person by the name of uh, Solomon ben Elia, uh, a 13th century um, Jewish leader. He was also the young son of another prominent Jewish leader. Uh, now, if we look at his bi biography, he was a communal leader. He he was um, he held he managed uh, a slaughterhouse, which was a very powerful position. Um, he was a cantor. Uh, he was. Yeah, he really occupied a lot, a lot of functions inside the community, and he was very much involved in books. He wrote books, he sold books, he bought books, he pawned books. He was a kind of um, intermediate for books, um, um, a simsar, a broker in books. Um, he also initiated the writing of books by paying people to. To, to write books and then promoting him, a kind of entrepreneur, a medieval entrepreneur. So it, it's through his biography and through this, uh, this um, uh, type, we can understand how deeply these elite members were involved in the new culture, culture of, the, of the book. Um, another example uh, is the corp correspondence. Most of the letters in the Geniza the private letters uh, deal in some way with books, even the most private ones. Somehow they 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 mention books, either for, uh, for a buy as a selling or buying or new books that arrive to the market and so on. Books are an item that people, especially the elite members, wrote about. Um, 
here we have an example of a correspondence between Amram ben Yitzchak and Chalfon ben Netanel, two prominent persons that we know very, very well. At this stage, Abraham ben Yitzchak was a very old person and very sick. He was also preoccupied with a terminally ill wife. But when he writes to his friend, Chalfon uh, ben Netanel, what he asks for is, please send me a book. You can see it here. I have already asked you several times to send your poor, sick brother the exegesis of Isaiah so that he will be able to read it as long as he is still alive, and so on and so and uh, so forth. We have many other examples. Um, or the other, on the other part of the biological scale, for example, we have um, uh, Netanel ben Moses. Uh, when a very young boy, he was grounded by his father at home in order that he can concentrate of his, on his uh, studying. Um, young Nathanael, against his father's uh, orders, corresponded secret, secretly with his close friends, with his, with his peers. Um, but uh, what is striking about the, this correspondence, which all all was kept in the Geniza, is what do you think occupied these young, restless adolescents? It's probably not what you have in your mind. Yeah. They were occupied by books. So young Nathaniel asks his friends, his peer, to send him, to smuggle him some books so, so that he may, he may read. And this is in absolute contrast to what his father ordered him. Books were also turned to, became turned to be a supreme way to express intimacy and love and friendship. Lending, to, lending your own book, your own copy to somebody was really a gesture of love and of friendship. And this is perhaps most uh, visible in this very famous introduction by Moses ibn Tibon, Moshe ibn Tibon, uh, a very famous Spanish translator who translated the book of commandments, Sefer HaMitzvot, Kitab HaSharai, by Maimonides from Judeo Arabic to Hebrew. Now he writes, I ask one of the learned people, Maskilim, of our country who frequents Alexandria to look for it for the original version of the Judeo-Arabic book over there, and that if he could not find it, to write a letter on my behalf to the great Nagid, the son of the Rav, the composer. And he means Abraham Maimonides' son, the son of the author of the, of the book of, uh, of, um, uh, of commandments. And ask him to order one of the copies of his country to copy it and send it to him. The great Nagid, being so kind and benevolent and in honor of our long-lasting love and friendship, sent him his own personal book to copy. So we can see really that lending a book or giving a book your private copy as a, as a present was a supreme gesture of intimacy, of love, of appreciation. And this is very similar to the custom of the Khila in the Muslim society of a king bestowing or um, uh, giving his private used costume to somebody that he appreciates um, as, a, as a kind of homage and uh, in favor of the, the, the friendship. Books were not only written, sold, but uh, by, by these members of the elite, they were also produced. Now, we should understand that in order to write a book, you had also to literally produce it. You had to cut the papers. You had to, to mark the lines. You had to prepare the ink. You had to prepare the, red, the reed pens. Reed pens were used at this time in the East. And um, unlike Europe, in which it was uh, feathers of birds that were used for, for, uh, for pens. So uh, the, the, the process of manufacturing a book, 
of making a book, literally making a book, was also a very um, common subject on which people wrote to one another. I mean, these people, these members of the elite, and this is very illustrated here in a, in a, in a letter of Naharai Ibn Isim to Yeshua ben Yosef. Yeshua ben Yosef, by the way, was the leader of the community of Alexandria. Nehorai ben Isim lived in, in Fustat. And he writes, as, as for the Mariot, Mariot is the Lake Mariotis outside Alexandria, you have asked for. I have to warn you that at this time of the year, they are still wet. They won't be cut before August at the time of the vintage. I shall order them then and bring them and cut them for you into fine pens that will suit you best. And then I shall send them to you. So we can see how the reed pens serve those two intellectuals, not only as the working tools, but also another clearly related subject of general discussion. Perhaps in today's terms, these two men could be two academics or university teachers discussing the pros and cons of some new software or something. So the ancient books found by Schechter and his peers are then testimonies to a tremendous revolution brought about by Islamic civilization. It is not only the contents of the book, but also their physicality and the way they were produced, transmitted, and consumed testify these fantastic changes. Malachi Betarie has already shown the incredible amount of books found in Geniza that it doesn't only reflect the large production of books, but being a trash bin, after all, a depository of used books that have lost all value to their possessor, the Geniza also proves the intensive use made by books. Not only their use, not only their existence there, but that they were indeed used and read. Their intensive consumption. Books are then not only text, but also very indicative objects. As such, the physical traits of books, the state of their preserve, were they kept intact or are they worn and shabby? Their size, the quality of their paper, the way it was cut, the kind of ink they use, the layout of the pages, the mise en page, all these physical attributes should be clearly, carefully studied along the study of their content. Books were part of the large repertoire of intimate things that surrounded people's lives and loaded it with meanings. As such, they had the ability to to signify things for them, to establish social meanings on behalf of them, to carry personal and emotional meanings, and for, to facilitate for them interpersonal interactions and group attachments. In this respect, the Geniza resembles very much an archaeological site. It offers a glimpse into the material aspects of a past society. If we view the many texts accumulated in the Geniza as artifacts, we may gain significant insight about the beliefs, values, ideas, attitudes, and assumptions of, assumptions of the society, not only from their content, but also from their physical attributes. This is a time to use the archaeological qualities of the Geniza and to focus on its material dimension. Among the variegated Geniza documents, we have a lot of information about objects. All those inventories found in the Geniza, lists, dowries, bills, and accounts that had no place originally among Schechter's grocery box, boxes, but were put aside together and classified as rubbish, are actually a mine of information about material culture. A thorough study of this rich information about objects may also yield significant insight about the mind and beliefs of people of these civilizations. Beliefs are not only those that surface in a well-arranged theological essays of which people are aware and which they explicitly express in what they say, do, and make. Beliefs are submerged and hidden. A culture's most fundamental beliefs are often so widely understood, so generally shared, 
that they never need to be stated aloud, but are sometimes implicitly embedded in the most daily and trivial objects that surrounded the people's lives. In the following lecture, I will try to offer a glimpse into the rich material culture of the Genisa society and also to point at some prospective directions for future research. And thank you so much for your attendance. Professor Frankel uh, generously is prepared to take some questions. The New Testament was probably uh, written originally on, on, on scrolls and then written on at, at a later age, at a later, at later phase stage, written on, um, rewritten on, uh, on in codex. But there was probably some scrolls. You think there were? Yeah. Thank you. So, um, why did the Jewish community uh, adopt the Codex so late, while uh, uh, in the rest of the Roman uh, Empire we have uh, it's the uh, fourth, fifth century that the Codex uh, was uh, became a uh, common? That's a six million dollars question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I have yeah, I have several ways to explain it. Mm -hmm. First of all, this the the, the, the huge gap in which. Jews actually didn't write anything, mm -hmm. just transmitted everything orally. Mm -hmm. Another way to, to, to explain it, another way to explain it is that um, the first to, to adopt the Codex were probably Christians, the early Christians. And, and this was a year in which Jews were not involved. They knew probably about it, but they were not involved. Uh, another possibility that it was adopted by Byzantine Jews, it's also a milieu that was far away from Jews. They were not around there. They, couldn't, they probably knew about it, but it was not close enough for them to, to, to adopt it. <laughs> On the other side, I think, I believe that the Adab literature developed by the Muslims, which was a kind of encyclopedic and very large and very universal made it possible for, for, for Jews to know it, to read it, uh, to like it, and mm -hmm. also to adopt it. And by this way, they were also acquainted with, with, the, with the Codex itself and um, uh, applied it to their own mm -hmm. writings. This is another way to, uh, to explain it. Uh, so, two, two possible answers. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I was also, all of us are wondering mm -hmm. about it. <laughs> Why would the Jews of Cairo commit mundane texts to the Geniza? Uh, uh, presumably, if they were cautious enough to put sacred texts with God's name in the Geniza, they were also cautious enough not to write mundane texts with God's name in it. Oh, no. It, you were, but if I understood one of the questions, God, God's name, it's not the sacred name of God, if this, if this is what you are hinting at. But God's name appears everywhere. You start a letter yeah, with, with a formula of by the name of God. Yeah. So every letter has, may have in it, or probably has in it, in some way the name of God. Every, um, every document, every legal document has in some way the, the, the name of God. So, uh, yeah, uh, by the way, um, it, the things are still a custom that that is that is used. It's it is still a custom that uh, is around is around us. Personally, I can tell you that uh, I live in a small village uh, near Jerusalem and very very close 
to Beitar, which is a tar, uh, Haredi town of uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews. Now, each year, before Passover, before Pesach, I receive in my post box a very, very detailed uh, brochure with very detailed instructions about before Pesach, this is a time that everybody cleans the house and throws away everything. So very, very detailed instructions, you know, how to pay attention. For example, if you have a picture of a synagogue, the name of God may be in it. So pay very good attention and don't throw it away. Put it in the put it in the in the in the Geniza. So it's still. Yeah. By the way, it's not only a Jewish custom. Yeah, it, it's probably you have the same custom also in Islam, but probably only for Quran books and perhaps also in in uh, in Catholic uh, Christianity. Hmm. Can, can I ask, I mean, um, could you guess at how many books were put into the Geniza from the fragments that they decayed into? No, I, I'm too cautious to give any estimation. I don't know. I, what, I can, what I can tell about is some, yeah, let's say, over a hundred books up till now that were already reconstructed and republished. Uh, so, yeah, and this is just the beginning. So we, I were talking about hundreds, yeah. mm -hmm. many hundreds, perhaps. Yeah. But I wouldn't dare to give any precise number. I have a question. From what I understand, that the, the, the old Torah scrolls, when they were very aged, they were buried at some point. No. In okay. This yes, the Torah mind. scroll, when it was old, would get buried. It would yes. not be from now. Yes. So with these letters, was there ever a plan? Or do we know why they were accumulating for almost three centuries without ever getting buried? Was there such a plan? Or what was the idea of just keeping them in the Yeah, room? it was just accumulated. And perhaps this is exactly the reason that it was preserved so well, because it was behind so many <coughs> other layers of more and more paper. By the way, the is, most of it is paper. It's not parchment or certainly not papyrus. Yeah. Uh, and because of, perhaps, because of the, the, the dry weather in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, so it was preserved by, uh, quite well. Yeah. And uh, even more so, the, 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 the lower, the, the more ancient layer of, uh, of documents were even better preserved than the upper ones. The more we get higher in this pile of documents, the documents are less readable and more f and f fading, more faded. Um, when we think of the book as an artifact, so um, process comes into that um, equation. And when you show the letter of um, the son of Maimonides giving his own copy, um, does the concern about authenticity and replicating truthfully also come up um, in addition to these, you know, personal relations? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, with the revolution of the book, uh, a new concept of the author of the books came uh, came uh, came up. Most books until the 10th century were anonymous or collected, but uh, the, a, a new notion of who is who wrote the books, the author behind the books, as a, as a very specific personality, a very specific person, uh, with his, with his own prestige, uh, and and this also brought about a canon. Uh, hierarchical, uh, hierarchical canon. Yeah. What are the best books? What are the most prestigious books? What are the less prestigious? Or those who are, you don't waste your time for of, uh, uh, reading them. Yeah, the worst books. Uh, so, uh, absolutely, yes. Well, if there are no more questions. If there are no more questions, you as an audience have two options. You can go outside and enjoy reception and talk to Professor Frankel, or you can stay in this room for a week until next <laughs> week. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.